Welcome to the latest edition of our series, Leadership Lessons in Troubled Times. These free online sessions are brought to you by the Schulich Executive Education Center, or SEEK. My name is Robert Lin, Associate Director at SEEK, and the moderator of today's session, Leadership Lessons from the Front Lines. Our guest is General Andrew Leslie, former Commander and Chief of Staff of the Canadian Army, business leader, and former Member of Parliament. He will share his leadership insights from the front lines of business, government, and the military during his distinguished 40-year professional career. General Leslie will be interviewed this afternoon by my colleague, Alan Middleton, SEEK's Executive Director. If you would like to ask questions during the session, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We will try to ask as many of your questions as time permits. Also, we will be recording this fireside chat for those who are not able to attend today's live session. Now, let's get started. Alan, over to you. Thank you, Robert. And it's an absolute pleasure to welcome General Leslie uh, with us today. And uh, as most of you know, and as Robert's described in the background, uh, one of our general Canadian heroes, not only for his uh, work in uh, Afghanistan, but his whole uh, time in the military before that, but as a senior leader taking that skill into firstly politics and, and now into broader application. So welcome. Thank you. Um, so as usual, we'll, we'll do some question and answer back some forwards first, and then I welcome your chat session. So Andy, let, let's start by talking about planning and the need for agility. Because one of the things that's very clear um, in the military is the importance of the plan going into any action, but having enough flexibility to be able to change it. And if that resonates with people in the, in the current world, it should do. So uh, could you talk a little bit about planning and, and the need for agility? By all means, allow, allow me to set the scene first. It's easy to lead when things are going well. And a lot of people can coast a significant portion of their careers as a CEO, as a senior manager, or as a president of an organization. But inevitably, at some point, there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And a huge crisis, in many cases, causes leadership teams that haven't planned, that haven't thought ahead, to freeze. And when they freeze, arguably, obviously, nothing happens. And all too often, it's the first critical moments of a crisis which determines the results for the larger organization. So I would urge all budding CEOs and presidents of universities or colleges to think about the options that lie in front of you. Gather your team when things are relatively quiet and going well, and just brainstorm, or in the Army, we call it a war game, the possible scenarios that are ahead of you. For example... What happens if suddenly we lose 25% of our clients for reason X? What do we do if our major supplier goes offline and they've said one week and now it's 10? Or what happens to our business if, oh, for example, there's a pandemic and just about everything shuts down? Now, that may be an extreme example and far-fetched, but guess what? We're in a pandemic now. I don't think many people believe this is the last one we'll see in our lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you're making those adjustments, even with the pre-planning, that ability to think, what do you do immediately? And how does it affect the medium and longer term? So that's a key part of this. Um, and, and to add in another thought, one of the things that risk management always talks about is, you can't just talk about what you do. In many cases, you've actually got to have it uh, take place and, and put people through the action. Um, what, what would you say from your background would, uh, would help in that area? Any organization to survive, and the principal focus, of course, is the safety, protection, and productivity of your people, probably in that order. Um, you've got to actually war game what it means, but then you've got to actually probably conduct rehearsals. Hmm. Let me get back to the operating premise, though, that in the absence of a plan, either nothing happens or you make the wrong decision. You brought up the whole idea that tension between flexibility, between contingency planning and reacting to the moment. 
an initial plan, which you should have war gamed, covering say eight or nine common scenarios, common in the sense that that's what you can reasonably expect your industry to go through in a bad day or a bad week or a bad month. Um, it allows you a starting point to make decision-making based on local circumstances and local minute-to-minute -minute inputs that you're getting from the folk that work around you. Mm -hmm. It allows you to modify a plan. And all too often, I've seen organizations and governments that essentially are staring at a blank sheet of paper when the really big crisis hits. And what's one that comes to mind? Well, let's talk about a variety of governments at provincial and federal level that we're staring in some cases at a blank sheet of paper. And by the way, this is not an anti-Canadian rant because I think Canada's done quite well in comparison mm. to some friends and allies and one in particular. Yes, absolutely. One of the things that you talked about that's very important in this area is that front line, that, that ability of having the plan and the contingency and the rehearsals involving the front line. One of the things we've heard from our other leaders is the, the flattening of a hierarchy and the importance of two areas, communication, so you actually know what's going on, and, and I'll, I'll quick story on that in a minute, but then secondly, that we're getting that feedback from people who are trained in, in a way that can help us. The example I'm going to use was, is going back to 9-11, whereas it turned out the different emergency forces were on different radio wavelengths, so couldn't communicate. And that was one of the big changes that was made following 9-11. So even simple things like that in communication. So two themes for you to comment on, communication and the importance of the front line and getting them involved. Well, let's go back to 9-11. I was a, a young one star, a national defense headquarters, uh, newly responsible for uh, communications, signals intelligence, signals intercept electronic warfare. And uh, two days after 9-11, I found myself in a very small airplane uh, with airspace cleared, landing in Washington, DC, and the mm. Pentagon was still smoldering uh, because the communications links were not robust enough to survive whatever happened. And so the whole bunch of face-to-face -face dialogue had to take place and a whole bunch of issues had to be resolved between people mm. in this age of complexity. So. You're absolutely right. Communications is obviously the key. The key to everything that we do in terms of working in groups, communicating our intent, desire, and also communicating information to those folks who need it so they can make the appropriate decision. Now, there's always going to be creative friction in there, which can be good and bad both. Um, in my experience, you can never have enough experience in public speaking. So all of us should always be learning how to do it better, faster, smarter. All of us should be practicing as often as we can. In my case, I won't pretend to be a great public speaker, but I have been trained by your tax dollars at a variety mm -hmm. of rank levels throughout my career. Just like I and every other soldier, sailor, airman, or airwoman has been trained on how to do contingency planning for worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Confidence is important, of course, how you project yourself, but especially when times are dire and people are looking for that leadership figure, calm, confidence, humility, by all means, always inclusion. Make sure that you connect with your audience, you bring forth their ideas and brevity. All mm -hmm. far too often, I've seen a great communications plan mm -hmm. and great plans crumble under the weight of someone who's fallen in love with the sound of their own voice. Mm -hmm. So absolutely communicate got to be done. How you do it, the seniors will set the tone. The CEOs, the president, the directors will set the climate in which their, their subordinates, their workers, their peers feel comfortable approaching them with information about the good and bad. And by the way, in a crisis, you, you want to know the bad stuff too. Mm -hmm. So beware of leaders who only want to hear the good news. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about the front line as part of that, one of the things you and I have talked about before is that important blend in how you structure what you do in leadership between micromanagement and leadership. Because as a senior level person, you're not necessarily in touch on a day-to-day -day basis with what's going on unless you've got that communication with your front line. So how do you, how do you assess that balance, micromanagement versus what leadership is about? Well, uh, once again, in the a case of the armed forces, their personnel are trained to differentiate between a variety of different levels of operations. So at the tactical, the 
which is where the rubber really hits, hits mm. the road. So in the case of the pandemic, the tactical would be the hospitals, the ambulance, yep. the, vent the, vent the uh, respiratory technicians, the doctors. Oh, by the way, let's not forget the grocery store clerks. Absolutely. The drivers of the foodstuff vehicles that deliver it to the grocery stores, the farmers out in the fields mm. who are collecting the food that we eat, uh, the veterinarians that are taking care of the animals. Yep. You can see this whole idea of essential services is very different from previous models. Yeah. And by the way, that information existed in something called the Emergency Measures Act at the federal level, which the federal mm. government chose not to implement which I would argue caused them to have a bit of a slow start. But we'll talk about that once this pandemic's over. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of differentiating between what you really got to get done and what you can put off until tomorrow so you can focus your energies on those two or three big things that hopefully you've already thought about in the quiet times before the crisis hits. Thinking about your time in the military, um, and one of the, the things military is rightly regarded uh, highly for is the training at, at every level, um, the focus on training people. So you're not just taking their natural skills, you're using it. Talk to us a little bit about what lessons from the, your military background you could uh, see being used in your life, in, in politics and the organizations you're working with now, but, but in general for non-military personnel. Well, the, the single most important lesson, I think, uh, I've taken away from my 35 years in uniform and a couple of wars, a couple of peacekeeping missions, mm -hmm. fighting forest fires, ice storms, uh, and the list goes on and on and on in a variety of countries around the world is teamwork. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole idea of the team, the needs of the team taking precedence over the needs of the individual. Mm -hmm. And the bonds that are established through rigorous training and dialogue and learning from each other in surprisingly blunt conversation. Mm. A private in the infantry who's about to launch an attack in an hour against hostile Taliban forces in Afghanistan is extraordinarily blunt with the army commander, me, because he's not happy with his boots or his night like, vision equipment or the thickness of the ballistic plates inside his chest carrying harness. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's refreshingly blunt and direct. Mm -hmm. And that trust and bond has got to be there. He's telling me stuff or she's telling me stuff that she needs and wants right now. And it's my job working with the rest of the team in auto to try and get it done. Teamwork is number one. The whole idea of the team ahead of the individual is number two. Mm -hmm. So just because you're a member of the team, it's not a temporary measure. The third one is essentially loyalty to the organization, to the institution, and to the members that make it up. And if you can keep that straight in your mind, then quite frankly, I think you'll have a great experience as a leader, and you'll always have a guiding light to sort of to steer you during, a, during times of difficulty or when there's thunder and lightning outside. Mm. That sense of, of teamwork, of sharing a common goal, is something that some of our previous uh, interviews have come up with, talking about one of the reasons, perhaps, north of the 49th parallel, we've done a little better than south, because different sectors, government, private sector, the healthcare sector, the emergency sector, have seemed to talk to each other better with, with a common goal um, relative to our friends down south. So one of the things we talked about before is Maybe this whole uh, pandemic will help us reduce the silo thinking and get that teamwork to a common goal. Um, and the great thing in the military, you have clear common goals. Well, I can only hope that uh, the lessons that we're learning, relearning during this pandemic stay with us for as absolutely long as possible. There's a danger, however, as in the case of military, so the further you get from the sound of gunfire, the yeah. further removed in time you get from your last combat or near combat operation, the more there's a tendency to revert back to the stovepipes and silos of your near peer groups. And therein lies a huge danger because what we are facing, others have faced before. I mean, there are haunting similarities between what we're going through with this pandemic and COVID-19 as compared to the Spanish influenza from 1920. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I have a great uncle 
who fought as a Canadian soldier in the First World War, came home to Montreal, and in 1920, he died of Spanish influenza after surviving four and a half to five years in the trenches. Mm. That was a fairly common experience. And they learned quickly, or relatively quickly, some lessons which we are relearning now. Now, it's much more complex now. This is a much more insidious disease in, in, in this current form. But let's not abandon the lessons that we're learning now. Let's make sure that we stay united. These would be the United States. Um, the numbers are not good for them. However, their society is far more, far more, far larger, as we know. Mm. Though their system of government is different from ours, there are marked similarities, more similarities than differences. Mm. But the authorities and the tension between the White House and the governors is perhaps higher than it's been in certainly my memory. And that doesn't contribute to overall mission success, which in, in the final analysis is taking care of all your citizens, not just the ones in your province or your state. It's a hard balance in politics, isn't it? Because you know, part of the democratic system and the parliamentary system that we have is that, that opposition and that questioning of decisions. But part of what seems to have been successful is that there seems to have been a high level of cooperation across the, the sectors in, in the last uh, four months. So uh, you've been an MP and you've been in, in Parliament. How do, you, how do you, you see that balance? Well, I thought the first couple of months, uh, say from the start, really for us was February. When I say us, I mean them, actually, because I'm mm. no longer a member of Parliament. Right. Just not the run. Um, but it didn't last long. And uh, unfortunately, two of the political parties got together and decided that they were essentially going to send parliamentarians home until the end of September. Yeah. Instead of allowing them that normal tension, creative tension in many cases, debate and discussion and oversight and rigor, uh, they decided to send the parliamentarians home and keep a special committee of the whole, which is not, a seat, that the committee of the whole has happened while parliament is not sitting. Mm. So um, this, uh, this, this normal model um, of, of that uh, dynamic of the opposition asking pointed questions and forcing the government to respond to clear the air or to allow Canadians to really see what's going on perhaps has been absent. Of note, during the Second World War, mm. the British Parliament, Westminster, was hit 14 times by German yep. bombs. And they, they kept sitting throughout. They sometimes had to move just down the street to another building, one of the churches, mm -hmm. uh, but they were always in close proximity to Parliament and the debates, and the questioning by the opposition was constant. Mm -hmm. Both Churchill and Mackenzie King in Canada maintained that approach that Parliament provided credibility and the means of communicating to a larger audience, welcome the exchanges to try and make better policy. Mm -hmm. As we think about the, let's call it recovery period, um, but I want to be cautious about that phrase because any historian knows the Spanish flu came back in the winter months. It Actually, the Spanish flu started about the same time as COVID, which is in March, and they, had, they, they gradually got it under control, and then there was a resurgence again in October. So, you know, let, let's not assume everything's going to go back to old normal. But as we move to the new normal or whatever we're going to call it, how would you summarize the lessons we should take from your perspective? What, what have we been doing right? What have we been doing wrong? What should we be thinking about? I think, Alan, you've asked the right question. I won't pretend to have any of the answers right now. Yeah. But I will say, just asking that question is exactly how we can pay honor and homage to those who've lost their lives to the disease and to those families that have been shattered. So we're at over 6,000 dead. It's probably gonna be eight or 10 yep. shortly. Um, and the numbers who have been affected, which in and of itself can be a, a horrendous experience. And the impact on lives and jobs to the tune of many unemployed and literally billions spent, now hundreds of billions spent just in Canada alone. So let's put this to use for the next time mm -hmm. we have a, a national crisis. And it will happen. I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but it will happen. They always do. It's just a question of when. 
Yep. Let's learn from each other. Let's figure out what we can and should have done better, faster, smarter, without throwing rocks at each mm. other. Yep. Did the federal government under the prime minister make some mistakes? Of course they did. Of course they did. Did everyone involved at some point make a mistake or two? Of course they did. Yep. Is that criticism? I, mean, I suppose you can infer it is, because, but no one's perfect. They did the best they could, and they're doing the best they can under the circumstances and the hand of cards that they've been dealt. But if we had spent a couple of years thinking about doing some planning, mm. some contingency work, some wargaming, to use one of the phrases I've explained mm -hmm. earlier, maybe, just maybe, we can learn from this experience. We can figure out what the patterns of communication can and should be. What are supply chains and their fragility? What does that mean? How do we make them more, more robust? Mm -hmm. Who's been helpful in this type of activity? Who is not? Not because they're individuals, but because of the functions they represent. It doesn't make sense to have all these independent medical authorities at provincial and territorial level overseeing. Right. Them. I don't know. But let's talk about it. Please yeah. don't let's just shrug and go about our merry way. Because from my understanding as a non-medical expert, COVID-19 is going to be around for a very long time. Yep. Hopefully there'll be a vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Um, yep. But let's not forget that the essentially the impact of the Spanish flu, its lingering effects are still seen now. Mm -hmm. People are still getting the flu and they're dying of it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about an, something we're all experiencing. In fact, we're doing it now, which is the likely future is going to be, if not, totally replaced by people going to work and getting together, much more online communication, uh, much more uh, use of, of this method as a communication, but also as decision making. What are your observations on that? Because one of the things you've emphasized rightly, in my view, is building trust amongst people who work together and understanding of a common goal. Is that more difficult online? Is, is that something we should be paying a little more attention to? I think there has to be a balance. And there's an argument to be made that prior to the pandemic, it was business as usual. And essentially, the work day had not evolved much since the days of, to be blunt, madmen. Yeah. Where you went into your advertising agency and there was all sorts of people clustered around and you're jammed in cheek to jowl and you gathered around the water cooler or whatever you did, you yep. did with a gang, with a group. Um, think of the wasted time and effort getting to and from your place of work. Think of the distractions from actually getting things done. Think about the quality of life of the individuals who, if they're in jobs where they don't actually have to show up but can do it through the marvelous technologies that emerged over the last four decades, mm -hmm. let them do it where they think they can do it best. And that gets back to the trust function and productivity. So I think we're all learning a great deal about how to operate in, quite frankly, this century. And mm. it's a long overdue. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to encourage people to send in questions because uh, we'll move to a, a chat session questions. But while people are coming in with the, the questions, um, how have you managed your, your personal life and process through, through this period? Um, because, you know, number one, with the, your background, you've got, great learning capability, and, and also you're being challenged. So are, are we going to see books and articles and lots of stuff coming <laughs> out from General Leslie? Well, they might see an article or two. Uh, a book, probably not. Um, I'm a soldier. I can follow orders. <laughs> and uh, when the orders make sense, I'm really going to pay a lot of attention. And it made sense to stay at home and to wash my hands and wear a face mask and don't go out unless I really had to, to to sustain the family. Um, I have enjoyed certain portions of it. I've enjoyed the information flows. I've enjoyed learning how to interact in ever increasing numbers online. Um, I find myself doing Zoom and team calls for many hours right. per day. And um, all in all, I would say that uh, I've learned a great deal in these last five months, but I'm starting to get Bored is not the right term, but a little bit <laughs> frustrated with the length and duration of the pandemic. Yeah. So the alternative, the alternative is causing harm to other Canadians yeah. or other nationals. So don't do it. Yeah. yeah. Don't go to a beach just because you can. 
because yeah. either you're going to get sick or you're going to cause someone else to get sick. Just, yep. just wait a bit longer. I want to reflect back on that because one of the things that's clear from the, the military background and, and the military in general is this sense of teamwork and care for the other. And I've been struck, sorry to make a politically unacceptable statement, but I'll make it anyway, with friends, newsreels from down south, which show a real sense of isolation. And this is right for me, and I, I don't really care how I affect other people. I think in Canada, we're slightly better at that. But that's a key element in the military, this, this sense that, you know, you don't leave somebody behind and you, you, they're there as a team. What can we do outside the military to engender or reinforce that concern about the other as, as part of this process? Well, perhaps that's one of the big lessons we have to learn from this pandemic. As they learned in the years immediately following the Spanish influenza from 1920 to 1924, 25 yeah. specifically, um, there's the value of those who have literally day in, day out, risking our lives to take care of us. Now, it's easy and more than deserving to glamorize the doctors and the nurses and the respiratory technicians and the ambulance drivers and the firefighters and the police. But how about the person who is going to the grocery store for just about minimum wage and day after day dealing with a long line of people, some of whom, and we, you know, we still haven't come up with a national policy on masks, but without masks, and in some cases, and especially during the beginning, they had no protective equipment. Mm. They knew the risks that they were putting themselves mm -hmm. to. Those are the frontline folk that we have to value. We yep. always have to value everybody, but they deserve special recognition. So think of other scenarios and think of the role that they help, they contribute to helping the rest of the team. And uh, that's both inspiring, it's humbling, and it means we have some rethinking to do. Mm -hmm. And important in the area that we're involved in, in our education systems, um, because that's again part of the, how you think do things as classes. And it's interesting to hear people with younger families, you know, from six years old up to 12 or 13, how much they're missing, the kids are missing being with each other. So how do we, how do we touch that and tap on that uh, area? Yes, social beings. In terms of what you do, um, one idea of reinforcing team is that in the military, there's not many things you do by yourself. You're always in groups, clumps, of five, yeah. 10, 100, 1,000, 50,000, whatever organizational level you're working with. Um, but when you get to your training venues, most of the activities, most of the tests that you go through to measure your competencies, your performance, and your character um, are done as part of a group. And you're there mm -hmm. with a group, amongst a group. You're not singled out as the individual per se. Sometimes you are, and that's for assessment purposes only, but it, it's the whole idea of the team succeeds. The team suffers casualties. The, the team grieves. The team reacts, gets on with what they got to do. I think it's really important. I want to read uh, uh, something from uh, Jennifer Pennell um, to you, and then I'm going to come back to you and ask you, summarize, what do you think we should take forward from this process? But I, I want to read it because it's not so much a question, but it's an important comment she makes. Okay. I just want to say, Lieutenant General Leslie, thank you for your service. It takes a brave person to stand on the front lines for our amazing country. I have many members of my family that have served and are still serving, and they are the bravest I know. I don't think I have an actual question because everything you have said is very inspiring and I will take some of the lessons you have given them and apply them to my daily work. I really just wanted to say thank you. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, I've got one question that snuck in, um, and, and it's all your roles in the past, and, and this is from, uh, uh, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, Mr. Damji. With an American first policy down south, what do you think is the future for our international community, especially in our dealings with China and other similar wayward countries? And I'll just add a comment that a lot of people may not know. General Leslie, 
that you are involved with the uh, negotiations of the new NAFTA, the USMCA. So very appropriate question. So what do you think the future of that international cooperation with all that's going on is? Uh, remember how we talked about lessons learned and let's not let the tragedies of today um, reduce essentially uh, our opportunities to learn to prevent future tragedy. So at the end of the Second World War, horrendous casualties worldwide, yeah. uh, a variety of lessons learned and resolve resulted in the formation of a variety of supranational organizations, the United Nations, NATO, the Warsaw Pact. Some were military alliances to balance the forces one against the other, and others were seen as unifying elements and a world administration, if you would, to try and reduce the chances of a thermonuclear war. Um, for about the last 20 years, there's been friction and the rise of the strong men, they're almost invariably men, uh, has, has occurred. And um, of interest, by the way, the nations that are led by women in fighting the pandemic seem to be doing markedly, markedly better than those that are led by men. Now, I'm not bashing men. I'm yeah. just stating what data is showing us. Especially our friend in New Zealand. Right, figure it out. You, you make up your own hypothesis, whatever you want to call it, just a statement of fact. Yeah. Um, so where do we go from here? And what, how, what does the future hold for us as a society? Well, first of all, job one, try to get through the pandemic in a way that has as many citizens as possible healthy, and our economy is able to restart without completely bankrupting the aspirations of the younger generations. That's a tough thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and quite frankly, at the national level, uh, the various parties, I think, are united in their desire to do good for Canadians. Obviously, they have slightly different agendas, and they're going to have competing visions. But out of that dialogue, though it may appear like noise, noise and chatter, uh, there will be creative friction and some good, some good ideas will emerge, ideas which are better than if it had been done unilaterally. I still haven't answered the question, I'm afraid. Um, we are going to have to tread a very careful line yeah. Our largest trading partner is the United States. Our second largest trading partner is China. China. Yeah. Uh, each has enormous opportunities with which Canada can enjoy in cooperation with them and other trading partners. We now have more trade deals, international trade deals, as Canadians than just about any other nation in the world. So we want to be able to leverage our remarkable um, network of trade organizations and trade treaties so that we can essentially trade with the world. And we do have to trade with the world. We are blessed with natural resources. We're blessed with amazingly well-educated folk. We're blessed with beautiful geography and an assured supply chain for foodstuffs, which is pure. And a lot of people would love to have it for their kids. But we have to trade to continue to allow our economies to go, oh, and by the way, to pay off our debt. Mm -hmm. which is now a little bit large. Actually, it's an awful lot larger now yes. than it was just a couple months ago. Absolutely. So it's, it's a fine line. I'm confident that the leaders of today and tomorrow will be able to navigate case by case, issue by issue. Um, and but what's going on down in the United States right now, and I've got, like most Canadians, I've got lots of American friends. As a matter of fact, I've got lots of American relatives. Uh, this too shall pass. If for no other reason, then... It's constitutionally mandated. There's a finite limit for the first term and the second term of leaders in the United States. And there's an election coming up in November. We'll see. Absolutely. General Leslie, it's been an absolute delight. So we are out of time. I'm going to hand it back to Robert to uh, add to our thanks. But uh, it's been a privilege having you on today. But Robert, uh, take us uh, onward. Well, and thank you very much. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for attending today's session. Please feel free to join us at our next fireside chat, Leading Frontline Hospital Workers in a Healthcare Crisis. That's on July 16th at 2.30 p.m. with Ruth Tagger, the Executive Vice President at Sunnybrook Hospital. My special thanks to General Leslie for being here today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Leslie. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. 
Be well, everybody.